Changing a brief tack in direction now, um, our next speaker is Theo Gray, who is the co-founder of Wolfram Research. Um, he is currently the director of user interface technology, and he is also, if not quite a winner of the Nobel Prize, he is a winner of the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, one of his great passions is the, is the elements, the periodic table of elements, um, and has created, a whole, has created his own company to, to basically sort of market the, uh, market the periodic table and has created a wooden uh, periodic table for which he won the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, so far we've discussed life and death for, for human, and, human and virtual. Um, Theo is going to talk a bit about, about science education now and about basically um, you know, putting the passion back into this. Uh, TED stands for technology entertainment design, um, but education is also one of its great passions and it's sort of spun out from there. Um, so Theo is going to touch upon that and then I think we might have a special bonus presentation immediately following that um, based on some, uh, some really breaking news last night. So. Uh, since the theme is supposed to be life and death, I thought I would uh, sort of get right to the point with a provocative question. Um, and I should say that I am fully qualified to, to speak on this topic because I'm a parent and have actual children of my own. And I'm completely aware that, that you know, any harm coming to them is basically the worst thing I could possibly imagine. Um, but having said that, I'm also the author of this book, uh, which I would hold up if it weren't serving a more important purpose. Um, my favorite review of this book uh, was written by a chemist writing for the Chemical and Engineering News, the, the weekly news magazine of the American Chemical Society, um, who wrote that he was uh, entirely prepared to say that as professional chemists, they would, of course, be free to ignore the subtitle. Um, and then he actually read the book and realized that I, I meant that to be taken seriously. Um, so I'll give you a little example. So one of the experiments in the book is uh, if you're tired of that stale store-bought salt and you want to make yourself some fresh salt, um, how would you go about doing that? Well, of course, you, you start with a cylinder of chlorine gas and you blow it into a, a bowl full of molten sodium. And the reaction is quite vigorous and the smoke that comes off is common table salt, sodium chloride, um, which we're using here to, to salt a basket of popcorn that we've hung over it. Um, and this, I think, is a nice little bit of science demonstration. Um, this is what happened when the net melted because I hadn't anticipated that it was apparently a meltable net. Um, and the popcorn fell into the sodium and, and created uh, this really quite lovely explosion with uh, balls of, of molten flaming sodium flying off in all directions. Um, now, of course, no one was hurt in the filming of this article um, because we know what we're doing. And there were huge fans in the studio behind me and the photographer blowing the chlorine out through the open bay doors and I was wearing a full face shield and a leather coat, a welding coat. Um, and you know, the, uh, the expectation of something unexpected happening was very high because when you're blowing chlorine you know, at sodium, who knows? Um, but you know, make no mistake about it, that cylinder, a little lecture cylinder of chlorine gas could kill all of us many times over. It's extremely nasty stuff. Um, so, uh, which leads me to this wonderful quote. Um, uh, and th this is absolutely true. Um, you know, what, what he's saying here basically is this stuff sells. You know, people find it fun. This book is quite popular with students and, and science teachers of a certain ilk. Um, because unlike most books of home science experiments, it doesn't pull any punches. Um, about the only thing they wouldn't let me write about is how to make gunpowder using only ingredients from a garden center. And that's on my list for next time. Um, I really would like to do that one. It would be a great, a great column. Um, there is, of course, an extremely stern warning section, um, although I don't believe in telling people don't do this at home. You know, I, I hate that phrase. Um, what I tell people is they need to take personal responsibility for evaluating whether they ought to be doing a given experiment or not. Um, and uh, one of the analogies that I like to use, this is a demonstration of why safety glasses are a good idea. Um, one of the analogies I use is that the science experiments in here are not beginner experiments in the same sense that wingsuit cliff diving is not beginner skydiving. Um, you know, if you want to learn how to skydive, you start out in an airplane way out in the open sky with nothing around you, and you jump out of that airplane many, many times until you're pretty comfortable with it. And then you might start jumping off cliffs wearing a bat suit and gliding five feet off the ground at 100 miles an hour, which, by the way, you should Google for videos of that. It's absolutely amazing. But the people who do that don't do it as their first skydiving experiments. Um, and likewise, 
some of these experiments are really not things you ought to do as your first science experiment. Um, however, once you get better at it, they can be pretty fun. Um, uh, so, which, which brings us, though, to the serious question of, um, you know, what am I going to do if I ever get a call from a parent whose, whose child has been injured or killed because of something they read in my book? Um, you know, am I prepared for that? Uh, and what would I say to that parent? Um, and I think anybody who's, you know, who's going to write material like this needs to think about that um, and consider whether they really want to do it or not, whether they actually want to publish material like this that has the potential to generate that phone call. Um, and I think the answer is there is nothing I could say. Uh, there simply isn't anything I could say to a person in that situation. And fortunately, it's never happened. Uh, and, and I've been writing this column for Popular Science Magazine, in which this book is based since 2003, and we are very careful. But, you know, I think the bottom line is that, as my slide says, hard cases make bad law. And one should not decide whether it's a good idea to do something on the basis of a tragic accident that may or may not occur. Um, so, you know, so basically the question boils down to, uh, do you think that science is important enough to do something that is potentially risky? Are you going to put your kids' lives at risk for science? If you ask the question this way, particularly, I think, in this particular country, you're not going to get a sensible answer. Um, I pretty much no. No, I don't think so. Um, so let's try asking the question a different way. What are you willing to risk your kids' lives for? Again, I don't think you're going to get a really you know, well thought out answer to the question phrased this way from most people. You know, some people are intellectual enough to realize that there are, in fact, answers to this question. But let's try it this way. Uh, do you think your kids should stay inside playing video games, or should they go ride their bikes, get some exercise? Um, I think most people would say, you know, that's a good thing. Go outside, get, you know, get some sun. It's a beautiful day. Um, and the parents who keep their children locked up inside and never let them out probably aren't doing them any favors. Um, so, in other words, you think bike riding is worth risking your children's lives for. You, you know, you will put them in harm's way because you think exercise is worth it. Um, and, you know, people act on that belief every day. Um, how about, you know, playing sports? Is that a good thing or should they, like, stay inside, watch TV? You know, most people would say it's a good idea, you know, builds leadership, you know, teamwork, and, I, you know, maybe they'll break a leg. I, I don't know if people think that consciously, but that's what they do. They act on that belief that it's worth taking those risks in order to get the benefits of physical activity and teamwork and leadership skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's ask it this way. You know, sit at home texting your friends or learn some science. You know, do some hands-on science experiments. Um, I think, you know, phrased this way, a lot of people would say, yeah, science is a good thing. They should learn. You know, they should do some demonstrations. You know, they should, they should have a teacher who's engaged in the classroom and, um, you know, willing to, to put on a, uh, some, some, some fascinating things that will entice them and get them interested in science. Um, and uh, no, I have no gruesome science experiment photos. They probably exist. I've asked around. Um, no one I know can find any. Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is people don't go out of their way to take gruesome bicycle accident pictures or gruesome sports injury accidents, but those things are so common in comparison that those photos just exist. They're just, you know, they're everywhere because those things happen daily. Uh, and, you know, what are the statistics? Tens of thousands of people killed every year. Uh, and, 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 you know, sports injuries in schools are so common they go completely without comment. Um, whereas, uh, science experiment injuries, although they are not non-existent, they certainly have happened and they will continue to happen, they're incredibly rare in comparison. Um, and apparently not enough. I mean, you can find, you know, if you look on YouTube, you can find some great uh, examples of uh, science experiments gone wrong that students have filmed with their cell phones, but none where injuries occur. Because even when you see these big fireballs, it's usually, you know, usually nothing really bad has happened. Um, so basically the answer is that people will accept risk if you ask them right. Um, and, you know, and basically we'll admit that getting out of bed in the morning is a pretty risky thing to do uh, when you get right down to it. Uh, 
and you know, compared to the risk of many other things, you know, science is not a particularly dangerous thing. Um, but then they will immediately follow up with, but nothing unnecessary. You know, not, um, you know, we're not gonna, we could make it safer. I want it as safe as it possibly can be. Don't do anything unnecessarily risky. Um, you know, people understand that riding your bicycle or, or, or playing football or something is, is inherently risky and there's really nothing you can do about that and you can't get the benefits of, you know, outdoor exercise unless you're outdoors. Uh, and, you know, meteors could fall on your head or something. Who knows? Anything could happen. Um, but in the case of science, I think there's a large swath of the population that really doesn't see that there's any need for any measurable risk at all. Um, you know, people know that playing a simulated video game version of football is not the same thing as actual football. Um, but uh, I have encountered, uh, you know, a, a non-zero set of people who really believe that uh, doing simulated chemistry is good enough, you know, it's fine, it's safe, there's no real need for kids to actually be exposed to, my God, chemicals. Um, you know, that's what, you're gonna expose my child to, to chemicals in the classroom? Uh, that strikes a number of people as a, as a, as a sort of a, an insane idea that one would even do such a thing, uh, since after all there's simulations available. Um, I, I kind of think that these people ought to, to go to doctors who have only ever worked on little dummies and fly in airplanes piloted by people who have only ever flown simulators. Um, you know, it's not a good idea. And, and science is really like that too. If you want to get people interested in science and uh, skilled in its practice, you need to, you know, let them do it. Uh, which brings us back to this little quote here. Um, uh, there's, I think, quite a few kids, and I'm, I'm speaking primarily here of boys, um, who become interested in things when they're exciting. Uh, and in fact, one of the, the attractions of science is that it is a powerful and exciting thing. It goes out and does things in the world. It has effects on the real world. Um, and that inherently involves a level of risk. If you're gonna do something powerful, it could go wrong. If it couldn't go wrong, it's not powerful. Um, and unfortunately, the way that science is taught these days in a lot of places, and I'm thinking of my own kids, uh, it gives off this very strong sort of vibe of this really doesn't matter. You know, this is all just kind of kid stuff and, and, and not important in the world uh, because of the way that it's approached with a sort of a very, I don't know, very ginger sort of a touch. Um, and uh, let's see, we have video here. Um, so I think that, you know, there's, there's real value in communicating the fact that science is a big thing that goes out and does stuff in the world. And sometimes it's dangerous. Um, and that makes it exciting. Um, and if you want to have sort of a generation of uh, young people, so this is, I'm, I'm, I'm taking uh, propane gas and blowing it through mosquito netting that's wrapped around a candle to demonstrate this remarkable fact that the flame doesn't go through the mosquito netting, uh, which was discovered by Humphrey Davy and is, 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 is quite remarkable actually, how well this works. Um, that you know, the rest of the room doesn't explode because the fire is contained by aluminum mosquito netting. Um, and you know, I think if you want to generate, uh, to, to, to sort of generate interest, uh, this kind of thing actually matters, uh, that, you, that uh, you, know, you show people what you can do. Um, and I think this is even more important for people who are not going to grow up to become professional scientists. Uh, um, you know, a lack of appreciation, uh, or a, a lack of, a, a, you know, a generation of scientists, this puts us sort of at economic risk. We'll, we'll lose our competitiveness against other countries. But that's child play compared to a, the general population having a lack of understanding of science. That's, that leads to famine and, the, you know, a loss of the place of science as, you know, a force for good in the world. Uh, and deaths in the millions, not in the one or two a decade, like hands-on science experiments. Um, the, uh, the people who invented the concept of being a professional scientist, um, uh, Joseph Banks, Humphrey Davy, uh, Michael Faraday in particular, um, they were known for their public demonstrations of science. They were all excellent speakers and they gave uh, public spectacles, essentially. Um, in order to create the public interest uh, and the public support to create the institutions which allowed people to work 
and be employed as, quote, scientists. They also invented the name. Um, Humphrey Davy invented the notion of the, the Christmas chemistry magic show. This is one at the U of I um, last year. Um, these things continue to this day, and they're put on by uh, chemists who, for the most part, know what they're doing. Uh, and very few of them result in fatalities. Um, and, you know, I think the people who do this, they do it because they know that these kids, and they're mostly, you know, 10 years old or whatever, eight, 10 years later, some of them are going to come back and become students. And um, that's a really good thing. You know, it's, it's worth doing this in order to get people interested. Um, so, you know, fortunately, I'm uh, uh, far from the only person who believes in the value of uh, robust science education, particularly in the public schools where it's needed the most. Um, I think the biggest problem is that we're all ninnies, uh, you know, and, and are afraid to, to, you know, basically stand up and say, this stuff is important. It's as important as football, you know, and if the star football coach's player gets hurt on the field and is out for three weeks, this is like, oh, I'm sorry, you've lost your player, you know. If the chemistry teacher's student is injured to the extent of being out of school for a couple of weeks, this is like, oh my God, what have you been doing in your classroom? You know, we better put a stop to it. Uh, and, you know, as much as one would not want to encourage that sort of tragedy happening, I think if it does, the response needs to be, that's a terrible accident and we're going to keep doing it. You know, we are not going to sabotage the future of our uh, educational system and our science education system because of a tragic accident. In the same way that the football coach were a parent to approach and say, well, you ought to just cancel football, would say, no, we're not. Go away. We're going to keep doing this because this matters. Um, and, uh, you know, so basically I think it's, it's, it's worth it and it's important to stand up for it. Um, just as much as it's important to stand up for outdoor exercise and football. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope I haven't alarmed you too much. Um, uh, science really is a, basically a pretty safe activity. Uh, uh, there have been accidents. There have been very, very few. Um, and if you want to see more, um, I have two recent books, which I will now hold up. Um, Mad Science with a, a nice portrait here. We spent an entire day getting me to look that menacing. Um, and my most recent one, The Elements, which is a, a picture, a coffee table photo book of the periodic table. Um, and all this is sort of at periodictable.com. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Theo. Before we have the, uh, the, the previous two speakers come out for, for Q&A before lunch, I'm going to take five minutes of your lunch while we have Theo up here. Um, he emailed me last night, thanks to the, uh, the kindness of Apple's intellectual property lawyers, the embargo on the iPad book, which he has created, is lifted and can now walk us through some of it. Unfortunately, we do not actually have an iPad here. Sorry, Julian. Um, you know, unless Theo's holding out on me. Um, you know, he is going to take us and walk us briefly through uh, through the elements. Um, well, I wish I, I wish I had I, I, I wish I actually had something to show you. Um, well, you could hopefully. But uh, let me because I I don't unfortunately have um, the 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 deal is that Apple has been telling us that. I don't know if you follow the whole Apple fanboy frenzy that's been happening around the iPad, which is due to be released on um, April 3rd. People's packages will arrive. People will be lined up at, at Best Buy and the Apple stores to pick up their units Saturday morning. Um, and all of the press was supposed to be embargoed until Saturday morning, until yesterday afternoon, when all of a sudden the news story is, oh, actually, there's a list of people you can talk to right now, and their embargo period is 6.30 Pacific um, yesterday. So um, actually, we ended up talking to a number of news outlets, and um, the, uh, the, the, it's all sort of out there. But I have no, nothing prepared, because I was prepared to simply not mention it today at all, because it's two days too early. Um, but it is, I, I, I'm just thinking, if I have any kind of a file to show you, um, uh, not really, but if you go to touchpress.com, which is a little company we founded, um, uh, it has a, a bunch of information. Basically, what we've done is taken this book, um, which is uh, a, you know, a, it's a nice, I don't know how much you can see, but it's a nice little coffee table book. It has lots and lots of objects in it. Um, and we've re recreated this in um, an electronic form where sort of one of the particular things it can do is that all of these objects, the, the, the e-book looks exactly the same, but 
well, pretty much the same, uh, glows. Um, but you can take your finger and you can touch any of these things and they all spin. They've actually been photographed uh, around a complete circle. Um, and uh, you can zoom them up and you can even see them in stereo using little stereo glasses. So you can see a 3D rotatable version of each object. Um, and it's kind of, it's, if you go uh, Google it, it's generated quite a lot of interest because uh, it has this characteristic of being sort of the thing that people didn't expect on the iPad. And we work very hard and, and very closely with Apple um, over the past six weeks to sort of tweak this thing up and get it to work really, really well on the device. Um, because it's, a, it's an example of an ebook that is not limited by the, the uh, previously accepted notions of what an ebook is, namely, it's kind of like paper. And, uh, you know, the main competitive advantage of an iPad over a Kindle would be that it has a flashier, sort of a nicer page turning animation, which is very cool and everything. But it's really not a significant advance over the paper version of a book. So we sort of decided to build something that was um, really an ebook from the ground up. Uh, um, built to take advantage of the capabilities of the device. Um, and all this would probably be more impressive if you actually, if I could show you one, um, or if you could see it yourself, or at least see the videos that I have on a different disc that I didn't bring because I wasn't planning to talk about this. Um, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that there are no iPad units um, outside of Apple whose existence can be acknowledged by anyone ever. Um, so, <laughs> It's not possible to show you anything, and the performance on the simulator, which I'm not supposed to show you anyway, uh, is terrible. So you can't see it either. Um, uh, but Saturday morning, you know, if you find somebody with an iPad, uh, get them to buy a copy of The Elements, $13.95 on the App Store, uh, and it, it'll be worth your while.